Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I need to get a motion to go into the 82nd special session. So moved. Second. Second regular session. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Carries. First item in introduction of an ordinance amending the code of the city of Hagerstown by repeal and reenacting sections of chapter 64, building construction, article one thereof, building standards. Mr. Mayor, move the mayor and city council introduce an ordinance to amend the code of the city of Hagerstown, chapter 64, article one, by deleting and repealing chapter 64, building construction, article one, building standards, and replacing it with a new article one, building standards, which provides for updated building requirements, licensing, and penalties. With this ordinance, the present Code provisions will be enforced through December 31st, 2019, and the new code provisions will become applicable January 1, 2020. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Induction of an ordinance amend the Code of the City of Hagerstown by repealing sections of Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 2. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move the Mayor and City Council introduce an ordinance to amend the Code of the City of Hagerstown, Chapter 64, Article 2, by repealing sections to Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 2, Demolition of Structures, which provided requirements for building demolition that are covered under sections of Article 1, Building Standards, and Chapter 187, Nuisance and Abandoned Properties Abatement. With this ordinance, the code provisions shall become effective immediately upon the effective date of this enacting ordinance. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Amend the code of the City of Hagerstown by adding sections of Chapter 64, Building Construction Article 3, there are property maintenance standards. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move the Mayor and City Council introduce an ordinance to amend the code of the City of Hagerstown, Chapter 64, Article 3. Binding standards is Chapter 64, Building Construction Article 3, property maintenance standards which provide Requirements for rooftop egress routes. With this ordinance, the code provision shall become effective immediately upon the effective date of this enacting ordinance. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Induction of an ordinance amend the code of the city of Hagerstown by repealing and reenacting sections of Chapter 64, Better Construction, Article 4, there of electrical standards. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move that the Mayor and City Council introduce an ordinance to amend the Code of the City of Hagerstown, Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 4, Electrical Standards, by deleting and repealing Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 4, Electrical Standards, and replacing it with a new Article 4, Electrical Standards, which provides for updated building requirements, licensing, and penalties. With this ordinance, the present code provisions will be enforced through December 31st, 2019, and the new code provisions will become applicable January 1st, 2020. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Carries. And amend the city code of Hagerstown by repealing the enacting sections of chapter 64, building construction, article 5, their uh, plumbing standards. Mr. Mayor, for the Mayor and City Council, introduce an ordinance to amend the code of the city of Hagerstown, Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 5, Plumbing Standards, by deleting and repealing Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 5, Plumbing Standards, and replacing it with new Article 5, Plumbing Standards, which provides for updated building requirements, licensing, and penalties. With this ordinance, the present code provisions will be enforced through December 31st, 2019. The new code provisions will become applicable January 1, 2020. Second. Discussions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Amend the code of the city of Hagerstown by repealing and reenacting sections of Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 6, there are mechanical standards. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move that the Mayor and City Council introduce an ordinance to amend the code of the city of Hagerstown, Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 6, Mechanical Standards, by deleting and repealing Chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 6, Mechanical Standards and replacing it with a new Article 6 Mechanical Standards, which provides for an updated for updated building requirements, licensing, and penalties. With this ordinance, the present code provisions will be enforced through December 31, 2019, and the new code provisions will become applicable January 1, 2020. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Approval of revised policy for Chapter 64, Building Construction Standards Permit Exemptions. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move the Mayor and City Council approve the attached revised Chapter 64, Building Construction Standards Permit Exemptions Policy. This policy will guide staff as they inspect properties and provide 
Permit services for customers. This policy shall take effect on October 1, 2019, and shall remain in effect up until the enforcement date of the pending ordinance updates for Chapter 64 of January 1, 2020. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Approval of resolution of the purchase agreement for unimproved real property on Visa Boulevard in Hagerstown, Maryland, with North Point Development LLC. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move for the Mayor and City Council to approve a resolution authorizing an addendum to the purchase agreement for unimproved real property on Basel Boulevard in Hagerstown, Maryland, with North Point Development LLC to extend the settlement date to October 31st, 2019. The addendum to the purchase agreement is attached. Second. Uh, discussion. In favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Approval of an ordinance for the 2019 pavement, uh, approval of change order for the 2019 pavement preservation program. Mr. Mayor, we move to approve change order number one for the 2019 pavement preservation program between the City of Hagerstown and Craig Paving, Inc. This change order is for additional paving work on Northern Avenue from Potomac Avenue to Oak Hill Avenue and also on Northern Avenue from Fountainhead Road to Pennsylvania Avenue in the amount of $84,543. This amount will be refunded in full by Columbia Gas and repaves areas recently damaged by gas line installations. Second. Second. Let's get back to Shelley. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Approval of two new full-time position support services and utility billing departments. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I hereby move for Mayor and Council to approve the addition of two full-time staff positions, one support services supervisor and one utility billing supervisor. These positions are necessary to ensure vital segregation of duties and expand the level of current service. These positions will be funded across all ap applicable funds, including but not limited to general electric, water, and wastewater. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries acceptance of assistance to firefighters grant. Mr. Mayor, hereby move from Mayor and City Council approval of the assistance to firefighters grant for the purchase of 86 self contained breathing apparatus units to include harness and backpacks, face piece, and two cylinders by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The equipment will increase the safety of our firefighters. The total grant awarded is $673,730. The federal share is six hundred and twelve thousand five ten. The city match portion of sixty one two fifty will be funded by CIP in the general fund. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We'll move out of the special session into the work session. Uh, we have a proclamation uh, for careers in construction month. All right, a proclamation for Careers and Construction Month, October 2018. Might be 2019. 2019. Yeah. Okay, we're a year behind, but okay. <laughs> we're going to move it forward, Careers and Construction Month, October 2019. Whereas Careers and Construction Month is an annual month designated to increase public awareness and appreciation of construction craft professionals and the entire construction workforce. Whereas during this month, employers, associations, and schools are encouraged to conduct job fairs, panel discussions, and local community events to inform students of the vast employment opportunities in construction. And whereas the construction industry is one of our nation's largest industries, employing more than 5 million individuals in the United States. And whereas the construction industry needs 1.4 million new craft professionals by 2022. Whereas we are pleased to honor the construction craft professional and the critical role they played in developing the city of Hagerstown. And whereas the National Center for Construction Education and Research was created in 1996 by the construction industry to standardize testing, I'm sorry, training, and enhance the industry image by promoting the hard work and dedication of our nation's craft professionals. 
And whereas the mission of NCCERS, Build Your Future Initiative, is to narrow the skills gap by guiding America's youth and displaced workers into opportunities that lead to long-term rewarding careers in construction. And whereas the goal of the Build Your Future Initiative is to shift the public's negative perception about careers in the construction industry and provide a path for individuals to become craft professionals. Now, therefore, be resolved that with the support of the City Council, I, Robert E. Bridget II, Mayor of the City of Hagerstown, Maryland, to hereby proclaim and recognize October 2019 to be Careers in Construction Month. Signed by me. That you get your new one. Thank you. You want to say a few words? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm Amos McCoy. I'm the CEO of the Associated Builders and Contractors here in Hagerstown, um, and uh, as well as the Bar Construction Institute. This is something that we're very excited about, and uh, one of the, the best parts about this is the month of October, we're going to have a pretty big celebration leading up to October 19th, which we invite everybody to come out on October 19th to our location at uh, 530 North Locust Street. Neatest part about this is all of the community that has come together to help with this, so I don't miss anything. Um, the Chamber has come together on track, Hagerstown Community College, Washington County Public Schools, Library, Discovery Station, Greater Hagerstown, uh, Leadership Washington County, and the Beacon House. And uh, Greater Hagerstown is here, on track is here as well. Um, but it's pretty amazing when you get 10 organizations to come together over something like this. Um, so we encourage everybody to come out on October 19th. It's going to be, that's our annual skills competition, so you get the opportunity to see construction students uh, participating in their competition. There will be a bunch of stuff going on outside, and hopefully all of our partners will uh, be there as well. So thank you very much. I, I, I want to say something. I, you know, reading through that and, and how anyone could feel that the, the construction industry is not a very professional advanced uh, uh, career opportunity is beyond me. Uh, you know, I know that um, I talk to people every day who, you know, uh, contractors say, I need welders, I need, you know, and I'm like, what do you mean you need them? You mean you can't get them? And they say, no, we just can't. I mean, the kids all want to go to college. You know? and, and I understand, but let me tell you something. I have a, I, I'm a, in case no one knows, I'm a McDonald's sweet tea junkie. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a guy at McDonald's who just started at the Bar Institute for HVAC, and he is thrilled to death. So I encourage him every time I stop there to keep at it and to, you know, go ahead and move forward in life because this is a great career for him. So. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, one of the neatest things is the amount of jobs right now that are available, and they're good paying jobs. Sure. That's the best part. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about economic development and those types of things, raise the tax base, we want to do all of those things. By getting those folks into good paying jobs, that's what helps to do that. So right. all of this helps to move the whole community. That's so. exactly correct. Thank you. Very Thank, much. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want to do a photo one? Oh, sure. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Western Maryland Food Council. Dan Fiscus and Lisa McCoy. Well, thank you, Mayor Brucci and council members. My name's Dan Fiscus. Uh, thank you also to uh, Scott Nicewarner for this opportunity to speak with you today. I'm the coordinator of the Western Maryland Food Council, and we wanted to tell you about the Food Council as well as a partnership for a healthy and sustainable food future that we're working on. And also with me today... I'm Lisa McCoy, and I'm a tenured faculty with the University of Maryland Extension, and I cover the three western counties, but I'm also overseeing my offices in Washington County, and I oversee the Washington County Food Council. So just about the Food Council uh, first in general, if, um, 
you're not familiar with it. We are fairly new. We started in 2015, but we've been building gradually uh, over those years. And we do represent the three western counties we work in, Allegheny, Garrett, and Washington County. Um, the Food Council is a collaborative effort between farmers, economic development professionals, health and nutrition experts, extension educators, scientists, and other professionals and concerned citizens representing really all different diverse parts of the food system in the three western counties. Um, our main uh, 501c3 um, lead agency is the Western Maryland Resource Conservation and Development Council, whose headquarters is here in Hagerstown. Other major partners are University of Maryland Extension, Western Maryland Health System in Cumberland, Garrett Economic Development, and many more. Um, as you can see on the one handout we brought, this rack card, um, our mission is to bring together diverse stakeholders to integrate aspects of the food system to sustain and enhance the environmental, economic, social, and nutritional health of Western Maryland. Um, the Food Council is really unique uh, in the way that we do this work in an interdisciplinary way. We intentionally work across sectors, and that's why we have this coalition approach. And we do this and have learned from other food councils. There are quite a few in Maryland. There are many all across the country. Um, because all of these folks are realizing that the parts of the food system are interdependent and they have to grow and improve together and so coordinated action is really essential. Um, just one example which I recently kind of learned about myself and to me really illustrates this, uh, working with partners at the Western Maryland Health System, uh, they have begun working to um, decrease food insecurity because they have found, and the scientific research shows, that being food insecure increases your risk for diabetes. And so at first I didn't really understand why that would be true, and I started to learn why food insecurity increases the risk for diabetes. And as you trace it back, you realize that in recent years, the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables has gone up more than the cost of processed foods. So the gap is actually growing between the healthier fresh fruits and vegetables in terms of price and the processed foods, which are off, often less healthy. Um, so folks on a limited income are faced with a really bad choice, and they often have to purchase less healthy foods due to that price gap um, in between. So this is just one example. There are many others that show <clears throat> how agricultural production, food prices, food insecurity, and human health are all closely inter interrelated. Um, and so to make progress, we kind of need to work on all parts of that together, and that's what the um, Food Council is all about. The other thing we wanted to tell you about today is the Partnership for a Healthy and Sustainable Food Future. This is the uh, framework we're using for a long-term effort, a 10-year partnership uh, to work on these kinds of uh, interdisciplinary, multi-sector parts of the food system. Um, we have chosen the three goals that are on the front of this flyer uh, as a starting point, their initial goals um, for tangible actions, measurable targets and outcomes, but we expect these will likely change and be improved as more partners join the effort with new expertise and insights. We think this is a good place to start. So the goals you can see are to increase the amount of locally grown food that we eat. Um, in Allegheny County, when you do the, the, an estimate, it's probably about 1% of the food uh, that we eat in Allegheny County is grown there. Um, and so that, we think, could, could go up to 10%. Uh, we'd like to decrease food insecurity uh, significantly and also decrease diabetes. The Food Council itself would like to lead that first goal. So we want to work on increasing the uh, percentage of food in our food supply from about 1% up to 10%. Um, you can see again on the back of this little rack card that estimates of the food economy are that if you use the number for about $4,500 that an individual spends per year on food, that is a $1.2 billion food economy in Western Maryland. So if we could increase that to 10%, that's $122 million that would be recycled coming from local agriculture and local food, 
which we think is a really significant economic development. Um, so um, in order to also get collaborative input on how best to work on this long-term goal to change the food system, we have the survey, which you guys have, and uh, we would appreciate your suggestions or ranking which of these you see as most valuable. Um, you could return that to me on the address on these flyers, or uh, maybe we can come back by, however it would be convenient to pick up those surveys. Um, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Lisa, is that another part of this partnership is that we are seeking funding partners. Um, the uh, Food Council is a nonprofit working under Western Maryland RC&D, and so we have been operating mostly on grants for the past four years, but grants can boom and bust, and when the grants are in, things are good, you work, 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 but when the grants don't hit, it's very problematic. I'm the third in the line of coordinators. Uh, when the grants didn't come through, the other coordinators left. So part of the grassroots fundraising strategy is to seek funding partners. If we could get 10 partners that would each contribute $2,500, we'd have a baseline, which could keep a half-time coordinator, and then we'd have continuity. We also think that would be great to show other funders, if we apply to USDA or Care First or these other large outside funders, that we have really strong local support. Um, and then the last reason is it provides a great way to, uh, to form a partnership. So if, say, the city were able to contribute $2,500 to our effort, now we know a basis for how can we work together to improve the food system in the ways that you all see as most important. Um, so we may need to learn how to go about making a request like that or if we get into the budget process, but first I want to let Lisa talk about what uh, she and her group are doing here in Washington County. Okay. Thanks, Dan. So I really just want to kind of give you a little quick update on what we do here in Washington County. Uh, each county is a little bit different in what their focus is, and when we first started meeting, um, what we decided was our focus really was to make people in the community aware of the local produce and local agriculture that's available because people really don't know that there's things growing right in their neighborhood and they go to the store and purchase food and purchase produce that's that's um, grown somewhere else so that was our main goal and I don't know if any of you have attended but we've done the Groundhog Day at, um, at Big Cork and that was kind of like an indoor farmers market that we had on Groundhog Day for the past two years that we sold out last year and it really was like really promoting local agriculture and having people know like what's available and where they can go and back and get more. They had samples, but you could go and um, hopefully went back and purchase things yourself. And we're going to expand that this year. Um, well, ne next year um, it's going to be expanded a little bit more. And then we also did a buy local campaign in July, encouraging people to take selfies um, if they were eating local food if with, when they were at the farmer's market or the farm stand. And um, we had some prizes for that. So that is going to take a while to get that, but that's kind of been our, our main thing is just that awareness and trying to um, increase the use of local agriculture in our in our community and some of the projects that we're looking to do um, next year one is actually to maybe work on helping you with another a second community garden because I know there's a waiting list for the one that you we have now and you know working with you on creating a, a second one and maybe a way that people who are limited income could actually have access to some of the foods that are grown in that garden and we could provide some food demonstrations with extension personnel and master gardeners could, could assist as well. So that's one of the opportunities that I would like to collaborate with, um, with the city on. And the other one is we're coming up with like a healthy restaurant program, a healthy selections. And the main push for that is that they, um, they purchase a certain percentage of their food that they serve in the restaurants from local producers. And so we want to promote local agriculture that way. And we also want to have healthy selections easier. So if they're going to, so if they don't want French fries, they do not charge an extra fee to have a side salad. So there's certain criteria that we want to work with some locally owned restaurants to help promote them and help get bring more business into them, but also that make it easier for consumers to have healthier choices and less processed food when they go to those restaurants. 
So that's another project that we could see a, a nice collaboration with the city to do that. I mean, we have, and we have lots of partners. I, did, I didn't share the partners, but we have people from um, Leslie Hart from the Economic Development Office in the county is with us, Meritus Health, uh, Valley Co-op. We have the, um, the Washington County Public Schools, the Health Department, Maryland Food Bank, the YMCA, uh, Future Harvest, and um, other individuals that are interested. So we have, we have a nice variety of people that are on our um, board, our, our council here, that are working on these projects. Any questions that you have for us? I guess the, the key question I have as far as the city is concerned with our, our low income residents is how do we, you can eat healthy, but it costs a lot. Mm -hmm. And how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? How do we make opportunities for people to make those choices? Uh, I don't know what that's the answer a, That's is. a tough question, mm -hmm. you're right. That is a tough one. Um, and I think, you know, with the farmer's market, I know currently, not with the farmer's market, but with the um, community gardens, mm -hmm. I know usually what it is that you, you buy a plot and you, and you grow your food there. But if there's a way that we could actually have um, people who would donate some, some of their produce to those who are limited income um, to do that. And we started to do, we we're going to do a program this year with, with a farmer's market of having some of the farmers donate food. And then we were going to connect them with a, a food bank. Um, so hopefully that's going to be on the horizon for next year once we get things worked out and, and all. So I think that's, it, it is a challenge because they are more expensive and, mm -hmm. you know, it's... You know, it'd be nice to see our food banks stocked with more uh, yes. fresh vegetables than processed foods that uh, contribute to the diabetes and uh, yes. the yeah. obesity. Does our farmer's market, do we support WIC and SNAP, the programs? Uh, certain you certain know? ones do. Like the farmer's market downtown, you have to have a certain percentage of your market to be strictly agriculture. And I don't think the, the Hagerstown market has other vendors there, so they don't have a, a percentage, large enough percentage to be uh, qualified in that program to okay. use those vouchers. But I know like the one out at the Elks Club does, and some of the other <coughs> ones do. Because that would be helpful. It would, yeah. Yes. But we have, we, too many, the, we have too many non- uh, not agricultural or, or food products vendors. Seems like a <laughs> no brainer. Yeah, it seems like a, a, a one of the efforts Sorry. going on in Allegheny County, um, which may be something that folks in Washington County could could adopt. And this is one of the benefits of the councils we share information, and we also are active with the other food councils in Maryland. But there's a thing in Allegheny County they're starting to work on called SWAP which is supporting wellness at pantries. And it's kind of a red light, yellow light, green light way to label the food in the pantry or at the food bank mm -hmm. so that the green are the healthier options, the yellow are used sparingly, and the, the red are, you know, rare. Mm -hmm. um, and those help the patrons coming in to get food. It also helps to, to educate the donors who are providing food. Let's provide more of the green light, healthy food options. That's just one example, and we can share those, you know, back and forth. Um, one of the things we'd like to do that Leslie Hart did here is an app for all the agritourism, all of the farmers markets. It's right on a phone, and we'd like to copy that um, out. Yeah, and so a lot of the info sharing and collaboration. Um, I think that your question, though, it's going to take quite a while. Those are really structurally things that are hard to tackle, and that's. I think it's going to take a long-term effort with a lot of co coalition. Yeah. As we have, I know in the city here, we have the classic food desert. If you mm -hmm. are of, of limited means, because you have all kinds of choices for fast food that you can afford, but very little in terms of restaurants downtown or anything else that serve healthy food that someone of limited means could actually go into. I do find this statistic interesting, this obesity and diabetes statistic, where it's in Allegheny County, it's 27% obese and 9% diabetic, but in Washington County, it's 15% obese and only 15% diabetic. So it's kind of a little bit, I don't know, lopsided. Just surprising that 
Yeah, and there are a lot of interesting things. That information came from Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, and they have a really good resource called the Maryland Food System Map, and they have tons of data like that. Um, and it's true, some of them are very surprising. Like I know Allegheny County had the highest percentage of people living in a food desert. So there were 56% of the population living in a food desert. We also had the highest, I think near the highest per capita fast food restaurants per person in Allegheny County. So it's hard, you know, when you dig into those, you have to understand each county yeah. is pretty different. Um, but we still think there's enough where we can help each other, you know, that. Yeah, Washington County actually has the second highest mortality rate from diabetes in the state. Mm -hmm. So even though in the state, in the state oh. we're behind Baltimore City. Oh, <coughs> yes. Anything else, guys? This is very, thank you. This is very informative. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up, on track update. Mayor Rucci, council members, city administrator and team, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to share out and provide an update on the important work of On Track Washington County. My name is Linda Mercurio and I've had the privilege of serving as the interim executive director for On Track Washington County for a little over a year now. As you may be aware, On Track is a backbone organization for a cradle to career initiative that's made up of more than 40 cross-sector community stakeholder organizations that we call partners. Our mission is to align public, private, and nonprofit resources from cradle to career, empowering individuals to maximize their potential through education and career credentialing. We evolved out of the Greater Hagerstown Education Forum and then into an initiative of the Washington County Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and we are now a newly minted, standalone 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our founders were both prescient and committed, and they sought to harness the power of community to inspire an education movement here in Washington County. In doing so, they adopted an approach to solving complex social problems called collective impact. Essentially, what collective impact does is it brings people together in a structured way to achieve change. It's a framework for progress, and it was co-created by community members and our cross-sector partners who chose to build a culture that fosters relationships, and trust, and respect, and we use data to continuously learn and adapt and improve programs and activities. As a collective, we seek to improve kindergarten readiness, increase standardized test scores, graduate more college-ready or career credentialed students, raise educational attainment levels, and build or attract a skilled workforce ready for the 21st century jobs. We also are focused on creating a healthy, engaged, upwardly mobile community. Why do we do it? We do it because the economic viability of our county, of our city, depends on it. Why else do we do it? We do it because it's the right thing to do. Those of us who are privileged have a responsibility to spend down our privilege in order to elevate the lives of others. As a backbone organization, we orchestrate the work of the collective. We provide vision and strategy, we support our partners' activities, we share data, we build public will, and we attempt to advance policy. More specifically, what OnTrack's job is, is to break down barriers, get organizations out of their silos, facilitate connections and conversations, and provide a forum for our partners to engage with one another through monthly success team meetings and quarterly full active partner meetings. 
In those meetings, On Track makes a point of ensuring that action items are followed up on. We want to make sure that we are all transparent and holding each other accountable. We highlight successes of our partners, we identify gaps and needs, and we look for evidence-based solutions to our problems. On Track and its partners organize around three distinct points on the Cradle to Career continuum. The first is early childhood education, the second is school age youth, and the third is workforce and career readiness. Each of these areas has a corresponding success team whose members are either partners or supporters working in that particular space or having an expertise in that space. At our monthly success team meetings, it's the role of On Track to keep our partners encouraged and to keep them focused on aligning their efforts, making sure that they are creating mutually reinforcing activities and programs, and we encourage them to find ways to limit redundancies and make sure that we are using our limited resources in the best way possible. Our collective vision is one of equity for Washington County residents, so that no matter race, color, social class, religion, or zip code, all are prepared to thrive. To measure our progress, OnTrack's partners identified multiple community-wide performance indicators for student success, and we track them and report them in our annual Cradle to Career report, which you have a copy of in your packet. If you were to take a look at page 10, and you don't need to do that now because I'm going to give you some data, but if you were to take a look at page 10, you would see that our efforts or the efforts of our partners are working. Um, we saw improvement in all but two of our performance indicators this past year. And while we celebrate this progress and we honor the really hard work of our partners, we also remain mindful that we need increased, accelerated, and sustained growth um, to, to move our numbers forward. So what am I talking about in terms of the data? Well, here's just a snapshot. 43% of our students are kindergarten ready. 36.9 students are reading proficiently by the third grade. 36.6 of our high school seniors have mastered critical math concepts. 54% enroll in college, 29.2% of our population 25 and older has an associate's degree or higher. We share this data not to point fingers, not to assign blame. We share it to illuminate the inequities and also to hold ourselves accountable. Our teachers, our public school system, our institutes of higher learning, our nonprofit organizations, the people that work in those organizations are our heroes. They are the ones who have the power and they are creating our future and making our community great. But they need our help. Um, we share this data by way of saying that we as a community have work to do. And let me be clear. On track exists because no single entity, no single system is going to be able to be responsible for health, education, workforce development, um, and the economic, economic viability of our county. We all have to be responsible. We exist because the challenges we face require urgency and foresight and the wisdom of the collective community to solve. We know. A community with high levels of educational attainment provides far-reaching social, cultural, and economic benefits. Evidence is clear that a better educated population reduces unemployment, crime, welfare dependence, and the need for costly interventions and incarceration. Educational success contributes to the quality of life advantages that exist in vibrant communities. On Track and its partners have come together to develop a comprehensive and data-driven initiative to ensure that residents have the grounding, the support, and the education that they need to live healthy, dignified lives and find rewarding and lucrative careers. We are laying important groundwork for parents, for educators, 
for government policymakers like you guys, um, pub business leaders, and, and anyone who is looking to make an impact. Like most efforts, however, to affect social change, our work requires patience, perseverance, and resolve. We must be adaptable, honest, and focus on continuous improvement, and we must always look to welcome new voices and constituencies to the table. This is actually the work of our time, and it is being done across the country in more than 70 communities like ours who have adopted Cradle to Career collective impact initiatives. OnTrack is aligned and affiliated with those 70 communities through an organization called Strive Together, which is itself a backbone organization. I had the privilege of going to Strive Together's annual convening I just returned from there. I got the opportunity to work with over 500 people who are doing this work all across the country. And I have to tell you this, 70 communities, most of them have been at it much longer than on track, are far better funded than on track, but in workshop after workshop and breakout session after breakout session, when I shared out what on track is doing, when I shared this report, report I was met with the same feedback, awe. Nobody could believe that an organization with such a limited budget, um, had it only been around for a short period of time, has been able to accomplish so much. This organization, on track, is well poised to be making impact now and in the future. Um, and I want to just sort of ask you at this point, um, and there always has to be an ask, right? Um, but I'm not here to ask for money, not yet. Um, I'm asking you to engage in conversation with us, to consider joining our leadership table, to amplify our voice, to celebrate what our partners are doing in a conscious, intentional way, um, and to just be present to our initiative. Um, Every conversation I had with people at Strive Together, they talked about how it was the individuals that make up the organization that are making the difference. And I see the momentum here. I see the people who really care here. This is a community that is full of heart and pride. And I know that working together, we can move those numbers where we want them to be in a short period of time. So I thank you again um, for giving me this time to provide an update, and I'm glad to answer any questions. And I'm sorry. It's OK. <laughs> Introduce right. the chair of our board, who I'm sure you might all know, Mark Halsey, and the vice chair of our board, Paul Fry. I have a question. Yes. Um, I've known the demographics of Hagerstown for a long time, but I want to make sure that I'm actually reading this correctly. On page 12, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming this is Washington County, correct? Yeah, let's see. And if I'm reading this correctly, the children under 18 years old in Washington County, approximately 50% of all children in the poverty level. Is that how I read that? 30.6% in public housing or public assistance and 18% below poverty level or are they I think they're two awesome. different two different, two different statistics yeah okay. mm -hmm. yes okay. mm -hmm. they're not additive they're not right okay mm -hmm. that's what that's what mm -hmm. thank you yeah you're probably not the right group to to direct these comments to um I don't know how many of you have kids in the grades that you're talking about here in the public school system. Uh, I have five of them that are kindergarten through sixth grade. <laughs> and uh, I would just uh, address a couple of points that you have, especially as it speaks to your five directives and the statement that you made about equity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm going to take off my, my council member hat for a moment and just speak as your average dad, uh, your average parent, that I think as a student in the public school system, that time seemed so much more simple to me attending school than it did as being a parent of children in a school. So uh, I have uh, five children, there are three different schools, 
If it would have been up to the directives of the current school system, I'd have five and four different schools across the county trying to figure out how to get them to those different schools uh, on a morning and pick them up in, in an afternoon uh, basis. But uh, so uh, my twin boys happened to go to pre-K uh, last year. Uh, we didn't find out until about a week before they were uh, to go into pre-K that they were actually getting into pre-K. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because this public school-based uh, process of equity had them on a waiting list uh, because we had to wait uh, to see if other parents of other children of less economic means were going to decide to attend first. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is not equitable. Uh, that to me is not fair. Uh, that to me does not solidify the process as a parent to secure that informal uh, learning environment outside of pre-K uh, if they so choose uh, or, or if they so were not able to get into. And so uh, I think that, that there is a disconnect in that arena where you say, I think it was 41% of all uh, kids of that age category in this county get to go to public pre-K. But those are the kids then that are 54% more likely to be kindergarten ready than the kids that don't get to go, uh, which is uh, apparently uh, to a certain degree an income-based decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you as a father of twins uh, where you're paying $2,400 a month in that alternative care service uh, that I don't care what your economic means are, that is a significant economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, in addition to that, trying to attempt to find an alternative informal care location mm -hmm. a week before public school starts mm -hmm. is not a simple feat in this county because there just simply aren't the requisite number of private resources uh, in this county to simply easily put uh, two, two uh, children into. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if it weren't for uh, places like Rehoboth and others that, that, that run uh, uh, these types of, of learning environments, alternative learning environments, it would be impossible. Uh, so that, that's, that, that's one comment that I think speaks to, to that concern that I have of a report that cites that kids that get to go to the pre-K are more kindergarten ready as it applies to it being an equitable process to kids getting to be able to go to pre-K to be kindergarten ready. Uh, it just doesn't match up. Uh, and, and as a parent, you know, you get to experience that firsthand. The second is, uh, one of the goals is this uh, reading readiness by third grade. Uh, fortunately, I have uh, my third daughter who uh, is in third grade uh, this year. Uh, she's in the magnets if she goes to, to you know, one of the three schools. Um, and I will tell you, you know, as, as any uh, parent of children in the school system, I will probably tell you, uh, the tablet hasn't made it easy. Uh, it just hasn't. I mean, they shove these things uh, into the kids' hands uh, uh, at kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the expectation of the learning environment that we have established now, uh, and, and whether it's just this school system, I assume it's pretty much every school system across the board. And what that has done is two things. One, it has disengaged that child from that early learning environment of creativity, uh, of the reading process. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, because that, that tool of convenience uh, uh, simply disassociates them with uh, the book process. It just does. Uh, the second thing that it does is uh, it uh, confuses and thusly disengages the parent from participating in that creative learning process, i.e. Uh, sitting down and reading the book and encouraging that, 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 that process of, of development of a library of, of uh, learning resources that you want your kid uh, to be engaged in, and so you see that they don't m they, they don't catch up uh, to, to that desirable process until fifth or sixth grade, uh, and I think that that, that detracts from uh, that K through third grade uh, uh, learn to read process that, that you're trying to instill in a child. And so uh, the second note I would have is is that you you know that that you reevaluate the degree to which you engage that child in the virtual learning process uh, at that early uh, childhood start. So those are just a couple of comments that I would have from sort of a bird's eye view of just your average parent uh, that gets to participate in this process. So as both 
an average parent, <laughs> um, a single mom of a 12-year-old who has been both in and out of the public school system, uh, uh, who was challenged to find pre-K uh, as well, um, and have a deep appreciation for what you're saying about that device, um, I would welcome your voice at our table so that we can have these discussions because they really are important. Um, this is the kind of thing that we need to be talking about more um, around our table. So we have room as school-age youth um, for a seat for you if you're interested. Good. And I would add that that's great feedback. When we sit around our table, mm -hmm. You know, most of you know I was in a restaurant business for a lot of years. My boss would say, when we're making decisions, we're not the paying customers. So when we sit around our, our table as a board, we're trying to get more of the paying customers in, the parents and some of the students. And so I don't have an answer for your equity piece, you know, although we can feed that back. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing you give that feedback to the Board of Ed and to, to other folks who make those decisions. We're a partner with that. I will tell you one piece of good news from my perspective, because I agree with the electronics to some extent. We do have a high school student on our board, and she made a comment at one of our board meetings just that, that you know what, we don't just like these iPads because we want interaction. We want to be able to ask our instructors and teachers questions, and we can't always do that sitting in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. So we hear that, and and I and, and so, I think that yeah. you know, and having a kid in in this in the gosh, six, yes in the seventh grade now, and and in the sixth grade, <laughs> I think that we have somehow in the learning process and the school environment associated that virtual learning process with mathematics. Mm -hmm. And they're just not the same thing. And mm -hmm. it's like we feel like we have to, to juxtapose, ju juxtapose the, the, this tablet into the process as early as possible to say if they get on that as soon as possible, then they will be mathematically inclined sooner. And, and the difficulty with that is, is that further disassociates the parent from that mathematical learning process because they're not aptal math. In other words, you know, my kid can, 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 can uh, dissect an equation uh, but, but can't do the basic uh, uh, fraction process uh, with a tape measure. You know what I mean? And I feel like we, we, we've taken uh, uh, practical and applicable math out of the learning process in, in favor of this virtual, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, algebra based, whatever you know you want to use uh, term for it, and and I don't think that they are as engaged then in the uh, the practical side of applying you know applied math uh, uh, in that, that that fifth and sixth grade learning environment. I, I think that they, they miss it. Look at the smartphones. How many kids don't talk to each other, sit next to each other, texting each other? <laughs> so it's you're right. It's complicated. It's something that we do provide feedback. And again, as Linda said, we're a part organization and. We'll certainly share the information mm -hmm. and we'd love to hear the engagement and we want people talking to mm -hmm. our group and to the folks who make those decisions. Yeah. And I'd just like to add one thing. Um, September 12th was the conclusion of the annual book drive uh, that several of our partners combine organize and that book drive usually collects anywhere between 14 and 16,000 books. Uh, that are then turned around and distributed to uh, school-age kids. Uh, so we are, in fact, putting books into into people's hands. I'm not I'm not denying the fact that the the formal educational process is largely based on the tablets, but we are getting books to people. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, next generation 911 system status update. So good afternoon. Um, as you're probably aware, there's a nationwide push to upgrade 911 systems, and it's both to um, deal with the challenges of technology and, and the changing ways that uh, people use technology today, but it's also a chance to take advantage of some of the um, 
some of the positive things that new technology provides. So in 2018, the Maryland General Assembly passed legislation saying that Maryland, you know, Maryland communities were going to have to upgrade uh, their 911 systems into what's known as the, the next gen 911 system. <clears throat> and uh, Bud Goodmanson and his team from the county uh, have taken the lead on this effort with uh, consultation and support from different members of city staff. And basically today, just invited Bud in to give an update on the, the status of their work, what the timeline is, and uh, then to discuss a little bit um, what that's going to mean for residents in the city that, uh, that may have to have their addresses changed. So I'll turn it over to Bud. Thank you very much. Uh, as said, my name is Bud Goodmanson. I'm the GIS manager for Washington County. It's part of the IT department. Of course, GIS is Geographic Information Systems, otherwise known as computer mapping. Uh, I have Tom Brown here from Emergency Services, Dave Hayes, and Jennifer Kinzer uh, from Planning and Zoning. Uh, so the next Gen 911 update, as, as uh, Jim said, it's uh, the nationwide program to update and upgrade 911. Uh, and coming to Washington County in the next year or two. So for those of you who remember, the, the old 911 it was rolled out uh, was like magic and had uh, a, a, an improvement at, at one point, the E911. So it's, it's been improving over time. Uh, this new version, uh, many people have heard about some of the new capabilities, uh, being able to text to 911, stream live video to 911, better call handling, those sorts of things will be some of the advantages to, to using NextGen 911. Uh, locations, as they're called in, will be by map instead of a list. Right now, the, uh, the Verizon company has a list of all landline phones, uh, the telephone number associated with an address. Uh, that's going to go away, and everything will be located by a map a GIS map, and, and that's that's where we come in. Every structure must be addressed, which we're we're making good progress on. Uh, there will be new infrastructure. Uh, the the calls as they come in will be handled in a different way. There will be a new server uh, called the <coughs> EziNet that will uh, process that uh, call as it comes in, and uh, the county is involved in contracting for that new infrastructure. The addresses themselves, and, and that's where uh, we come in with this working group with uh, my office, the GIS office, planning and zoning, emergency services. Uh, we're also uh, dealing with our PR department and uh, representatives from the city of Hagerstown uh, meet every month in a working group uh, to go over this process. So as far as the addresses, we need to make the addresses across the county as accurate as possible, uh, up to public safety grade. Up to this point, we've had addresses and streets in our GIS that, that shows you know, where everyone lives, but it's not been used for anything of this critical nature. So we're, we're striving for 90, 98% accuracy. That's the, uh, the goal that the state of Maryland has issued for this project. We're going for 100%. There's, uh, there should be no uh, argument about the need for that kind of accuracy. So these uh, calls will be fed into the new 911 call taking and dispatch software uh, to get the first responders to those who need it as quickly as possible without error. Uh, you may have heard from time to time errors have happened in the past and it involves life and property and we don't want to make any mistakes in the future. So we're doing what we can now to eliminate the possibility of those kinds of mistakes. The, uh, the addressing portion of it uh, will be kept up to date continually. We have a 72-hour window to make changes. Uh, if there's a new address uh, assigned or a uh, change in an address for some reason, we want to get that onto the servers in 911 within three days uh, for consistency. Uh, we're also asking the small towns in the county, uh, we're asking them to sign a memo, an MOU with the county to allow us to do the addressing in those small towns. They, they don't have enough uh, new development going on 
uh, to get good at it, and we want to have the consistency across the whole county uh, so that there's only one addressing authority, uh, except for the city of Hagerstown. Now, the city will still do their own addressing in cooperation with the county, and, and they're doing great at that now. Uh, and, and in addition, uh, loading the addresses from the city into the county uh, 911 system. So the city will keep their numbers uh, and still assign addresses accordingly, uh, coordinating with the county. Road names will still need 911 approval uh, before they, they're uh, recorded on plats for subdivisions. So as we go through this process, there will be some corrections needed. Uh, we have uh, looked at, we're going to be looking at the county uh, fire district by fire district and asking each fire company to assist us as we go through this. We've uh, done a pilot project in the Leitersburg uh, fire district to, uh, to look at a few changes that were needed uh, where there were uh, some roads that had a duplication sounding name or uh, there was a wrong odd or even side or they were out of sequence. So we did have a few of those and uh, we sent out notices for a few changes and, and they've been very uh, positive in, in uh, responding to those changes. So those, those kind of changes, although they're painful for the residents, they are being requested by the emergency responders because they don't want to have that possibility of an error come up. Because uh, we also need to remember that in times of uh, when they're busy, uh, one company covers for another company, which is covering for another company. So they may be going into areas that are unfamiliar to them. So we're going to be working with the city over the next year uh, to identify any possible changes that may be needed. Uh, we're also working with our neighbors uh, in the other counties in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, in Virginia because we're going to be more accurately defining the boundary of where those 911 calls are split. So uh, the boundary between Frederick County and Washington County is, is a little bit tricky because of the, the top of the mountain. No one really knows where the county boundary is. It's up there somewhere, but we are defining it in our GIS to be specific property by property so that when that call comes in, it goes to Frederick County or Washington County. Uh, of course, you don't have that problem with the city that they're all going to 911. So we're also working uh, with our PR, I may mention that, to get uh, the public involved so that they can give better information when they're making the call right now. Uh, you know, it used to be someone called 911 and they would answer, you know, what's your emergency? Now it's like, where's, where is your emergency? Location is so important and that's, that's what we're working on is the location. We're also working with the state of Maryland, as Jim said. Uh, they have a contractor who's coordinating with all the counties in a biweekly uh, conference call so that we're all kept up to date on how this process is going. <clears throat> so we appreciate your cooperation and help and can answer any questions you have. Will you indicate changing uh, homes that have out of sequence numbers? I'm curious, let me give you the example of my street. Uh, the house next to me is 318, my house is 322, and the house next to that is 328. Now, are those what you would consider out of sequence or no, like that's... 200 versus 300? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by out of sequence? Uh, they, they need to be sequential and in order. And okay. as, as we get in some areas where there's too much of a gap or not enough gap, we rely on the first responders to tell us, like, is that really a problem? Like where I'm at, it's, I'm 1217, but the next block's like 1700. Okay. Yeah, okay. Like right. The, the city has some unique numbering patterns, um, but as long as it doesn't pose a problem as the first responders see it, it won't need to be changed. If it does cause a problem, then we would like to change it. And we'll be working with the, the city. I an algorithm that helps us <coughs> make time when we're driving. And I'm not talking about speed, like no, I understand. excessive speed. We need to know, first of all, we're going to the right hand. If we get that wrong, the rest becomes immaterial. We need to know what we're going to the right right. We're going in the right direction. We're looking for the right block. And then we're looking for the right uh, side of the road. So if your number 
is an odd that's supposed to be on the left. We're expecting it to be on the left side, but right. we can process that right. quickly, still driving. But if we have to pick mailboxes apart one by one, and there are 100 mailboxes boxes on the road in that area, it's time to get through that. It's precious moments that we don't need to be expending. So we're looking for things to be in that. So when Bud talks about sequencing, we need to make sure it's 720 it's not before 714 that that the numbers are going up. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. I can still remember the first call I ever had on CRS in the 60s. I went to Moeller Parkway instead of Moeller Avenue. Do you anticipate any issues with those types of addresses or would the new GIS just resolve that issue? So, so road names that are alike certainly are problems. It hasn't changed since 1960. If we could have a perfect one and, and everybody said we're going to stand on and change them, we change them. That, that's just the right thing to do. We know that's probably not realistic because right. of the degree of issues that can cause. So we're trying to deal with things that have historically caused us an issue, the ones we know. And Bud has done a great job of communicating, at least in our test pilot, pilot with, the, with the first responders about what has created issues. And then likewise, again, making sure that we're in the right blocks. And uh, there are some addresses that are listed on this road, but the physical access point is on this road. In some cases, hundreds of feet off the interchange. And of course, we've had residents that aren't happy with that decision. But 12 o'clock at night, right. we're not able to discern that without picking through that. And that's just one that we stood pretty hard on. Those are probably the kind of things you'll hear most of the conversations about Hagerstown, at least I would guess. I haven't seen the data yet. Um, we reviewed what they listed originally as totality, which is all issues, and then we broke that down and said, where does it make sense? And we're trying to create a black and white line so that if a citizen was upset, hey, either you're north of this line or you're south of this line, but this was the line, and everybody was treated the same. Because when you don't do that and it becomes subjective, then we have a bunch of people upset with decisions and it's very hard to defend those and, and use a real rationale for it. So that's kind of where we're at on it. Thank you. So in, for instance, in the Leitersburg pilot area, we had 1,400 addresses and we had, through our initial look at it, we had 142 that were potential errors. After looking at them more closely and consulting with emergency services, we only had 52 that really needed to be changed. So those, those were changed, I think, out of those 52, we still might have two or three people that are fighting it. Hey, but do you have any idea how many you would think Hagerstown would have to deal with? Hagerstown has about 23,000 addresses, and there are, could be as many as 2,300 errors, potential errors. But as I said, once we look at those a little closer, <coughs> It, it will narrow it down to a, a much lower number than that. And what, and what you would be asking would be, let's just say there's 2,300, you take off half of those, okay? So that's, that's left with, you know, 1,200 some. We would be responsible for fixing those addresses or the county would fix those addresses the first time? We would work with the city, but I think that a letter should come from the city for those city residents. Even if the city is not the one, even though it, even though the city is not the one responsible for making the change, because if we send the letter out, and I'm just trying to get logistics here, if the city sends the letter out, the city's going to get the call, because people are not going to be happy if they've had an address, you know, one two three Main Street that now they become one two one Main Street. They have they're going to go through a lot of issues to get their address changed. Yeah. So now we're going to be taking the phone calls from those people. We don't really have an answer for them except to say this was done for this process. Right. Is there any type of appeal, you know, any, any type of process to where they could actually, you know, I don't want to say fight it, but appeal the address change? Well, what we do is, is we take the call, or our planning and zoning people have taken the call for this pilot program and tried to explain to them the need for that. And when they don't understand, we refer them 
to the 911 office. <laughs> So the, these guys. Tom, you're going to be getting a lot of calls from the city residents. I'm going to tell you. Don't set the addresses either, right? Post office sets the addresses. No, no, no. The post office does not assign addresses. The county assigns addresses in the county. The city assigns addresses in the city. The post office doesn't have final say on those address numbers. The process in the city is the engineering department. Um, selects the address with in consultation with both the county and uh, the mainly the city fire marshal uh, to make sure that everybody is in agreement that the number that the city has has selected is what is workable work then what we do is we send out letters to various agencies one is the post office one is the assessment office all of the utility companies in the area, making them uh, aware of this change that is being made or an address that is being assigned. But that's all, it all starts at either the, the city level or the county level, depending on where you are in, in establishing what the initial address is. The post office doesn't have the ability to say no. They have the ability to, um, I guess, to protest, certainly. And if they have a legitimate, if they have a legitimate reason why an address will not work for their delivery, yeah, they I can, was always under, always under that understanding. The post office has ultimate ability to say no. Um, not so much in the city. I mean, it's, well, it's you've never had that experience, though. Right? right. No, I've never had I that. Idea. If they said no, we would probably say. My experience that. in the county is that Google sets the map. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my business street name changed when Google Maps okay. erroneously published it, and then the street sign changed and everything else changed, so all of our stationary and business documents had to change. To right. We have Google Maps. Google does not. Uh, give the, the highway department the assignment to change a street sign. So we're you know, no, I'm <laughs> saying that I'm saying that the the Google made the, the change and then the county decided no, it must be that must be it. So we'll, we'll change the sign. It's easier to change the sign than invite Google, right? Uh, <laughs> and I think no, I would disagree with I that. think one of my concerns happen. along those kind of same lines would be would be consistency of address entry that if it's sent, if you're looking at a centralized 911 repository of addresses it's, it would seem to me that you would want a centralized data entry of addresses instead of the county doing everything for everyone else but the city has to take care of theirs to me that would potentially put city addresses at risk if our naming conventions aren't the same as what the county is yeah. <laughs> we, we do strive for consistency and, and there are certain standards that uh, I, I don't think we've had any trouble with the city, you know, conflicting with our standards. Okay. Uh, it's, it's fairly simple until you get into some weird situations, but for the most part, it, it's easy to, to maintain that consistency as long as you think it out ahead of time get the names approved and that's that's been a big problem because we know developers come in and they they want to annex and they say this is my development i want to name this street after my firstborn son but that name's taken so we can't do that come up with another name out in the county we've got a lot of places where there's a lane with four houses on it and we say if you get more than three houses on it you should name that lane so we let them come up with a name as long as it doesn't conflict with an existing name that's fine. Yeah, I just I just think a situation, especially if we would be tasked with doing 1,200 plus of our own address changes, that Summit Avenue could become, you know, two M's and one T, and then it could become one M and two T's. Or you see what I'm saying? I just I just want to I, I want to make sure that for if for a centralized data that it's done consistent that we ensure it's consistent. Yes. We're all for that. The spelling of road names and whether or not it's a road or a lane, that, right. that's important. Jim, how much, how much of that happens now in, in the city? How much, as, as opposed, new addresses and address changes happen? 
Um, it's infrequent, but it does happen, especially existing addresses that need to change. Usually they're, they're pointed out by uh, emergency services. Uh, there's a, they've identified an issue with an existing address. They aren't able to find it. We just had one recently that was brought up by the post office because there was, you know, it was a four unit apartment, but it was, you know, three of the units were accessed from the front of the building. The fourth was accessed from the rear, which faced another street. And there was confusion about how all these units were addressed. So we ended up making a change on, on that particular one. It's much, more, it's much more of an issue changing an existing address. Setting the new addresses, that's part of the normal right. planning and review process. But I think to speak to your concern, um, you know, even with the notification letters that we send out, that gets a lot of the key players that need to know about the change. Post office, assessment office, that sort of thing. But it doesn't help those property owners with other things, like mm -hmm. talking to their insurance agent and trying to explain why the house that they are insuring is at a different address now. Or sometimes with mortgages, we've had that where a mortgage company has complained because, wait a minute, the the mortgage we have is for this address, and now you're telling me it's a different address. Right, and, and we provide a, a letter to any property owner that has to change that is, you know, on official county letterhead, and this is the old address, this is the new address, and it's for this purpose, you know, the house hasn't moved, or anything like that, that they can submit to any anyone that's questioning their address. You know, deeds don't have to be changed or anything like that. So. And, and again, the number of errors is not going to be that high. We, for, for Leitersburg, you know, it was 10% until we narrowed it down. It was only 3.5%. So it's, it's going to be a much lower number than that once we start analyzing them. Good. Anything else? All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks. Okay. Preliminary agenda review for next week always stop me if you have any questions. Uh, we're going to have a work session first at 6 p.m. next week to discuss the MOU uh, with the Maryland Stadium Authority. Then we'll have our 7 o'clock regular session. Uh, we have an invocation. Um, Emily was scheduled whether you, it doesn't matter. Just let us know. For what? For the invocation. How you want it. How you want it. No, I haven't spoken Great. to him yet. Who's going for that? Uh, the pleasure of the flag. You're still some there. announcements. Uh, our work uh, work sessions in October or October 1st, 8th, and the 15th are all work sessions at 4 p.m. October 22nd is a regular session at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have some appointments next week. Hagerstown Youth Advisory Council, uh, Board of Traffic and Parking, and Hagerstown Housing Authority. We'll have citizen comments, city administrator comments. I'll make sure I ask you this time, Scott. Uh, mayor and council comments. We'll adopt the minutes of August 6th, 13th, 20th, and the 27th. Under the consent agenda, we have the Department of Information Technology and Support Services, ESRI, GIS Maintenance Agreement Renewal, ESRI out of Redlands, California for $35,000. Uh, departments uh, of Parks and Engineering, Bridge Repairs on East Memorial Boulevard, Concrete Central Incorporated, Gettysburg, Maryland, 84700 Street Tree Contract, uh, Botanica Enterprises, Inc., Moore, Maryland, 42288 City Park Outfall Pipe Replacement, Greenbridge Contractors, Inc., Williamsport, 56700 under the police department, the replacement of a heat pump, even mechanical contractor, 17,200. Uh, storage of body worn camera footage, Exxon Enterprise, Incorporated Phoenix, Arizona, 16,236. Utilities department under wastewater roof replacement and operations building, Panico Construction Inc., Maryland, 210,000. Can we discuss that more? Sure. Hello. We're a little concerned that there was only one bid, and it seems like an awful lot of money. Is it? Um, well, we adver we advertised for bids, um, and we actually expected the price to come in um, in the two hundred thousand dollar range, given the size of the roof and the type of the roof. Um, what kind of roof is it? It's one of the rubberized roofs, um, and it's the operations building, so it's you know it's a fairly large roof as well. Um, I did reach out 
when we did a roof project before, um, Height Roofing had uh, performed the work at the wastewater treatment plant. So I re reached out to Height, um, just, just curious why they didn't um, bid this project. And they just, they just said, we've got too much work. Um, we can't get to it. Um, so I don't know if that's the reason we only received the one bid, but you know I did reach out to follow up because I really thought we would have two. Um, we did. You have planned a on it coming in around two hundred thousand. We did. Okay. We we expected it to be uh, in that range. Okay. We did check this. We've not worked with this roofing company before, but so we did follow up and check the references. The references were fantastic. They were actually highly recommended from um, you know some of the other places that they've done work for. So as well as the um, manufacturer of the material. And, it, you know, I just Googled it. And, you know, if you want to believe Google, they claim $1.50 to $10 a square foot. But obviously, if you're expecting $200,000, that's more like $100 a square foot, right? Mm -hmm. It just seems expensive, but if that's what you were expecting. Yeah. We, we uh, when we budgeted for it, we figured it would be um, plus or minus $200,000. Thank you. You don't see any benefit. I mean, is there a possibility to hold off for six months and rebid? And the roof is leaking right now. We okay, have that's delayed what I wanted the work. to know. Um, what I wanted to know. We, we've replaced ceiling tiles uh, a whole yeah, lot. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, if you all anticipated that kind of cost, then you may have better than I did. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Underwater, the R.C. Wilson Water Treatment and Plant Boiler Replacement Beaver Mechanical Contractors, 427358 Underwater, also change order to water pumping improvement project, DMH Environmental, Glenwood, Maryland, 70687 Under unfinished business, the approval of an ordinance, quick claim alley 571. Approval of an ordinance, amend the code of the city of Hagerstown by repealing and reenacting sections. Uh, chapter 64, Building Construction, Article 1, there of Building Standards 1. Just so you know, A, B, or B, C, D, E, F, and G are all uh, approvals of the things that we introduced tonight. If there's any questions, I'm not going to read every single one of them. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you guys are freezing, so I want to get you out of here. Yes. Under new business, the approval proposal for an after school program for BTJ Dance Group. The approval of a proposal for an after school program at Parkside Community Center and the approval of Barbering School for the Arts Foundation Holiday Land Post Decorating Project. Any questions on any other item in there? No, no. Okay, City Minister, any comments? Uh, just a couple, couple things, Mayor. Uh, yesterday, uh, there was a proclamation that Chief Kiefer uh, was presented for International Gang Awareness Day. Um, just to read part of it. Uh, this year's uh, International Gang Awareness Day will promote benefits of prevention, intervention, and enforcement within our community, schools, jails, and prisons. Uh, this observance will educate the community on gang violence and how it can be eradicated through a joint effort of a committed, committed community. So thank you, uh, Chief Kiefer and HPD, for your, uh, for your work on, on, on this, uh, on this um, proclamation. Uh, this weekend, another big weekend in the big city. Yes. Um, Fall Fest and the Monarch Butterfly Parade on the Cultural Trail and in City Park. Uh, that all starts at 10 o'clock. Also in conjunction with Fall Fest is Porch Fest on South Prospect Street, uh, which is always uh, a good time for, for everyone. So within a very um, close area, you've got three very nice events. Is that it? Three That's it. events. Shall we? Nothing tonight. Nothing there. Awesome. I just can't wait to see how they get the monarch butterflies to line up. To all, to all march down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, air traffic controllers want it. Yeah, I don't know. Chris. Me either. So we're trying. Thank you. Uh,